Okay, have your Bibles opened up, if you will, to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, as we wrap up our series of messages looking at Noah and the building of the ark. And the question we've been challenging ourselves with this month has been, uh, what are we building? Because we've discovered that everybody's building something. God called Noah to build a vessel, an ark, for he and his family and all the living creatures that he would send to Noah to survive as God was going to destroy the earth with water because of his disappointment uh, in the earth. And so the ark became a vessel of salvation. So what Noah was building was something to save his family and ultimately provide salvation for mankind. And so we've been asking ourselves the question, well, in our homes and in our families, what are we building? Uh, What are we building our families for? Is our home, is my family unit, am I providing a a, a vessel for salvation? Are are my children going to know about Jesus? And what about my children's children or even their children and the people that we come in contact with? What are we building? Because we've been sharing with you through the course of this month that everybody, because you see Andy and Caleb have been doing all the handiwork up here with these letters. And we're finally going to kind of unveil what it is we've been trying to put together. But, uh, and I apologize for everybody in this section over here. Uh, anytime I refer to the letters, y'all just talk amongst yourself, okay? Uh, but, uh, uh, we've been talking all month that, that everybody is building something, right? We're all building something with our lives and in our families. And, and, and so that's why we've asked the question, what are you building? When I was a senior in high school, I took a class my senior year. See, it was my goal my senior year of high school to take the easiest courses I possibly could to graduate. And so one of the classes I, that I took, I mean, I took classes like art and advanced PE and, uh, and, and stuff like that. But one of the classes that I took my senior year was a, was a class called metal and electricity shop. Now, I had really had no interest in metalworking or working with electricity, but I felt like this would be better than an English class. And so, uh, and so this was the class that I, that I took my senior year. The first half of the class was dedicated to metalworking. And that was pretty easy because my project for that class was a license plate. That's what I made. I, I, probably some of my, my teacher probably thought I was preparing for my future of making license plates. I'm not sure. But that was, that was, and, and, to, and to be truthful with you, the license plate had already been cut out. Somebody had cut it out and thrown it into a scrap box and I was digging through the scrap box and I found something that looked like a license plate and I said, I'm going to make a license plate. And so that was my project. I got a pretty good grade on that. But the second part of the class was the electricity part of the class. And the first day of that portion of the class, the teacher comes in and he gives us all a kit. And he tells us to open it up. And then he says, what you have in front of you, boys, is is a transistor radio kit. And what you're going to do this semester is you're going to build a transistor radio. And when I looked at this kit, it was extremely intimidating to me. Uh, there were all these wires and gadgets and mechanisms and a casing that it went in. And then there was an instruction book. And, uh, and some of you, some of you, because you're wired this way, naturally, you're, you're, you're kind of chomping at the bit right now thinking about, oh, that'd be awesome to build a radio. Wouldn't that be great? Well, I'm not one of those guys. I like listening to the radio, but not necessarily building one. And uh, and so we began working. The first week, I mean, I was struggling to put this thing together. I mean, I had to read these instructions, and they were so tedious. And, and I was trying to do everything by the book so I could put it together. There were some guys in my class, by the end of the first week, I mean, they'd been cooking with gas, and, and they, they were halfway through their project. At the end of the second week, they were completed with their project, and they, they took them to the front of the room, and the, the teacher looked at them, and a bunch of show-offs up there with their radios already done and the teacher says all right fellas we're going to try these things out so everybody in class stopped and to see but see how these show-offs were doing with their radios and uh, he turned every radio on and not a single radio picked up a station not a station in london kentucky where we were not in corbin kentucky the next town down the road there was nothing in fact they didn't even pick up static well you have to imagine that this was an encouragement to me Because all these guys have been working so hard to to buy the book to build these radios. And so I came to the conclusion that it really didn't matter how I put my radio together. Because those who put them together by the book, they weren't working anyways. And so I just took my instruction book and set it off to the side. And for the next week, I just started sorting wires where I felt like they needed to go. And and connecting gadgets in there how I thought they needed to go. Every now and again, I'd look at somebody's radio. And if if mine looked kind of like theirs, I was happy with that. And, and, And I 
I, I, I really enjoyed that week. There was no pressure. I was just doing my own thing. I didn't have to follow the instructions anymore. Uh, but then, at the end of that week, the teacher came back in and he said, Boys, I got some good news for you. Last night, I installed an antenna on top of the school. We're going to plug these radios back in, see if we can get them working. So one by one, those boys who'd finished their radios brought them back up and they hooked, they, they, they plugged them into that antenna and they picked up stations in London and in Corbin and the radios worked and everybody was celebrating except for me. I wasn't celebrating because I knew that what I had been building wouldn't last. I knew it wasn't a radio. In fact, I had quit following the instruction book so long ago, it may look like a radio on the outside, but on the inside, it wasn't anything like a radio. You see, it's important that we evaluate what we're building in life. It can look good on the outside, but if it's not built to last, it's not worth much. It just looks good. Let's look one more time at Noah and the lessons we learn from Noah. In chapter 8, we discover, as uh, we come to chapter 8, we discover that Noah and his family have now entered the boat. They've been in the boat for some time. God brought rain down for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, uh, Noah is in this boat. and God told him, to, when he built the boat, he said, put a door in it. And God shut the door on Noah and his family. And he said, put a window in it. But the window has been shut at this time. So up until this time, it's Noah and his family and these animals inside this boat. They have no way uh, of steering the, 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 the vessel in any direction. They simply have to wait on the Lord. Last week we talked about uh, when you've done all that you can do, what do you do next? And the only thing you can do next is wait. And so they're waiting upon the Lord. In Beginning in chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, it says, But the Lord, the, but God remembered Noah. And all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed. And the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded from the earth in the end. And at the end of a hundred and fifty days the water had gone down. And on the seventeenth day of the seventh month of month the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat and these mountains are located in the eastern part of the modern day of Turkey it says the waters continued to recede until the until the 10th month and on the first day of the 10th month the tops of the mountains became visible Noah and his family are in the ark. God says God remembers them. God never forgot them. It's just a way of saying that God knew that they were there. And uh, and so the rains quit falling. And they still have to wait on the ark for a period of time. Because now the waters are beginning to recede. Now it tells us if we read further down through there. That after the rain that Noah opened the window of the ark. There was one window to look out. That has to be, that'd be tough. They opened the window of the ark and they looked out and initially all I could see was water. I'm certain of that. And uh, it tells us that Noah sends out a raven and a raven is a very hardy bird. And that bird went out and went to and fro but never returned. After some time, Noah trying to test the, test the waters to see if land was appearing anywhere, he sends out a dove, and the dove goes out and flies around but returns that day because it had no place to land. So Noah waits seven more days, and after seven more days, he sends another dove out, and that dove goes out and flies around, and when that dove returns, he returns with an olive branch in his beak. Now, the international and also the ancient symbol for peace is a dove with an olive branch. Because when this dove comes back, he brings back the promise that that there is hope, that, that there is peace between God and man. Because just as God said, even though God was disgusted and upset with the earth, now he's covered it with water. He saved Noah and his family and the living creatures in the ark. And, and this olive branch represents the peace between God and man and the covenant that God will be making with mankind. And so it's, it's good news that Noah receives, uh, when that, when the, the, and I have to imagine there was great rejoicing. Well, as I was thinking about this window, because, uh, I'm a window guy. I like to ride next to the window. Who's with me on that? You know, whether it's in a plane or a car or whatever it is, I, I like to be near the window. And when I was a kid in school, I wanted my, I wanted to sit in a desk near the window. I like the window. A few windows would be good right about now, wouldn't they? Open them up, cool breeze blow through. Let's just all imagine that's happening right now. Cool breeze blowing in on us. It'd be nice to have a few windows open. And so I've thought about this window. 
And when Noah and his family looked out the window, well, what did they see? Well, we know they saw a lot of water. But what, what was their worldview as they looked out the window? Because I truly believe that our worldview is a reflection of who we are on the inside. And, uh, and what did Noah and his family see outside the window of the ark? What do you and your family see outside the windows of your ark, of your vessel? Because I believe what we see, our worldview, reflects what we believe on the inside and what we stand for on the inside. And we can look outside the windows and our worldview may be a view of uh, something that's completely, uh, completely contrary to what the, what the Bible teaches us. You know, we say things like this. We say the great American dream and the great American dream can become our worldview. Everything, everything, the lens we see the world through is, is through the, 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 the American dream that it's all about making money and being successful. And that's the most important thing. And that's what, our, what we, that's the course we set our families on because that's our worldview. That's what we're about. Maybe your worldview is about being popular in the world that you live in or, or being the most educated. Or maybe it's this thing or that thing. It's reaching for success from a worldly standard. And that's your worldview. Maybe your worldview is, is, is all about being negative. Everything you see is a negative. You see the glass half empty rather than being half full. And when you look out at the world, it's all negative. And that's a reflection of who you are on the inside. You see, our perception and what we see on the outside reflects who we are and what we believe on the inside. What's your family's worldview? How are we raising our children and our grandchildren? Are we raising them to be successful in the standard of this world? You've got to listen. And we say this all the time. Well, I just want my kids to have more than I did. I've been guilty of saying that. People say that all the time. I just want my kids to have more than I did. So what we do is we set out to give them all kinds of stuff that we thought we should have had, but we didn't have. And that pretty soon becomes our worldview. We push and we drive our children to succeed in, in different areas because we want them to have stuff, to be stuff. The problem with that, no, no matter how innocent it may seem, is it's misguided. Because you see, the most important thing, we've been talking about this all month, the most important thing is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we open up the windows of our ark and we look outside, what do we see? Do we see opportunities to make it in this world? Or do we see opportunities to lead people to Jesus in this world? You see, our worldview should be centered more upon Christ and the opportunities that are there for us to share Jesus with other people. Because if we really believe, if we really believe that, that Jesus is coming again and that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, then that should become a part of our worldview. You see, because I truly believe that when we stand before the Lord at judgment, and we will all stand before him at judgment, I believe that when we stand there, he's not going to ask us, okay, tell me how far you went in school. Or tell me how big your bank account was. Tell me about the, the number of cars and, and, and your home. Tell me how they were. Tell me if you were popular in your community. Hey, were you voted most popular in your high school class? I need to know all these things in order, in order to, to figure out whether I'm going to let you enter into glory or not. None of those questions will be asked us when we stand before the judgment seat of God. When we stand before the judgment seat of God, it will be about our relationship with Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what we'll be judged on. And if that's what we're judged on, and we're talking about for eternity, forever and ever and ever, then that fact should be primary to us, not secondary. Our relationship with Jesus should be the most important thing. And if our relationship with Jesus is the most important thing, when we open up the window of our ark, we have a godly worldview. We begin to see things from the perspective of God. Uh, The opportunities God gives us to reach people for Jesus. The opportunities God gives us to stand up for truth. The opportunities God gives us to make a difference in this world. Not for our name or our piece of the pie. But for the glory of Jesus Christ. That becomes our world view. You want to know whether your vessel has leaks in it or not? What's your worldview? How do you see this world that we live in?
when we're sold out to Jesus Christ, we see opportunity beyond opportunity. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Many of you know this passage of Scripture. Uh, he's, he's talking about worry and not to worry about what you're going to wear or eat or, or different things like that. And he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What he's saying is, is, is just keep Jesus first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Keep Jesus first and his ways first, and God will take care of everything else. All these things will be added unto you. We worry about so many things that we have no control over. Let's put our trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And if we seek him, if he becomes the primary purpose for our lives, if he is is what we're all about, we seek him first and his righteousness, he will take care of all other things. Now, the good news is this. The good news in all this is, uh, is that the Lord promises, his promises will bring us peace. The Lord's promises brings peace into our life. And that's the wonderful news. When the, when the dove came in with the, with the olive branch, that was a symbol of peace, became a symbol of peace. God's promises will always bring us peace. We forfeit a lot of peace because we don't stand on his promises, right? We don't allow Jesus to be our foundation and therefore we forfeit peace quite often. Uh, Paul writes in Romans, the 16th chapter, and this is, this is the last chapter in the letter he writes to the church at Rome. And so he's kind of wrapping some thoughts up. And he says in verse 17 of Romans 16, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way they are, that, are, that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. He's giving them this final warning, and he says to us, brothers and sisters, he says, watch out for those who cause division or put obstacles in the way that are contrary to God's teaching, to what you have learned. And he tells us that we need to keep away from such people because they're not serving the Lord, but they're serving their own appetite. False teachers are serving their own appetite. It's what they desire. That's what motivates them to teach things that are contrary to the word of God. And they do it through smooth talk and flattery. And we have to be careful because people of naive minds can fall into this very easily. But then he goes on to say this thing here as in verse 19, speaking of the church at Rome, he says, everyone has heard about your obedience. So I rejoice because of you. And I want to make two application points for us to take home. And it's in this next part. He says, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. He says, I want you to be wise about things that are good. We need to be wise about what is good. Another translation says excellent at what is good. We need to pursue things that are right and good, things of God. If we're building something that will last, we'll be in the pursuit of God and of things that are good. We'll be wise about it. We'll understand it. We'll make it a foundation to who we are. It's talked about in our homes. It's talked about amongst family. It's it's important to us. We're wise about what is good. But then he says, and I want you to be innocent. About what is evil. Just as much as we need to pursue that which is good. We need to be running from things that are evil. We need to remove ourselves from things that are evil. You know what a beautiful thing is? It's Listen, this is literally a very beautiful thing. I believe this in the eyes of the Lord. This is a very beautiful thing. When somebody tells a dirty joke. And you don't get the punchline. That's a beautiful thing. You see, you're you're innocent to things that are evil. And when there's bad talk or or things of that nature, you just you just walk away, scratch it, you just don't get it. And you may even get made fun of because you don't get it, but in the eyes of the Lord, that's a mighty wonderful thing. We say all the time about our children, we say, boy, our children today, they're exposed to things so much quicker than I was when I was a child, or how children used to be exposed to, they have to deal with so much. I mean, we've said that a lot, probably most of us in this room at one point or another have said that about children today and what they're exposed to, and that's a scary thing. We live in a world and a culture that's, that's just taking ground all the time, that even the innocence of children has been taken away. So be innocent at that which is evil. And what that simply means is is that you're pouring your life so much into Christ and the things of Christ that the things of this world seem to grow dim to you. 
And that's a good thing. It's being innocent at what is evil. And, and then Paul says this very next verse, this verse of triumph. He says, and the God of peace, the God who brings peace, amen? The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. If you are wise at what is good and innocent at what is evil, the God of peace will deliver you and will bring victory and he will crush the enemy underneath your feet. You can trust God because he is trustworthy. And when you pour your life and your family's life into the Lord, what you're doing is you're building something that will last. You're building something that's seaworthy. And when the waters rise and the floods surround your vessel, that it will hold because you see, you've got it built on a foundation that will last because you've been building something but there are many of us and i'm going to tell you in the church today too there are many of us who are building things uh they're all the time building and working at something but it's not something that will last they've poured their lives into this world's culture and they're eat up by the culture of this world and and that what they what we don't understand is that when we do that we're at odds with the lord and so we're we're all the time working and we're all the time building but instead of building something, uh, something else happens, you know, because there again, when we go to the judgment and we stand before the judgment seat of God, but you spent your life building something, what you may discover is what you've been building is really nothing at all. If it's not going to last, what you've been pouring your life into is really nothing at all. And there's a lot of us. That have been influenced and corrupted by the world. And we're working all the time. But we're not providing for our family what needs to be provided. We're not building a vessel of salvation so that they would know Jesus. And when they stand on the day of judgment, they're able to stand and hear, Well done, good and faithful servant. You can build your whole life. And not build anything worthwhile. So we've been pleading. We've been pleading this month. Of asking you the question. What are you building? Because it's, it's our hope that all of us. Are building something. Something of value. Something of honor. Something which brings glory to the Lord. Because the truth of it is. When we're building something. Uh, we want to make sure that what we're building lasts, right? We want to make sure the thing that we're building is eternal. Are you building something eternal? Because if, you're, if what you're building in your family and in your homes, if it's not eternal, if it's not meant to last forever and ever and ever, if you're not preparing your children to know Jesus or your grandchildren to know Jesus so that they would be able to rejoice with you at the foot of the throne of Jesus Christ, if you're not building something eternal, you're really not building anything worthwhile and your life has been lived in vain if you've not been living it for Jesus Christ and preparing your family for, the, for, for, for eternity. Are you building something eternal? Because that's the most important thing. And if we're truly serious about families mattering, if your family truly matters, then then teach them the things that really matters. Teach them about Jesus and how they can trust Him and be so in love with Him and depend upon Him. And regardless of the storm that comes, that they'll be able to float because they're in a vessel of salvation that has been designed for all eternity. What are you building? In the very next chapter of Genesis, um, no one has family come out of the ark. What, what good it must have been. I don't know if they kissed the ground or not. I, I might have. They come out of the ark. And, uh, and as they come out of the ark, uh, God establishes a covenant with them. And uh, a covenant with God is a, is a good thing uh, because he, he doesn't break covenants. And he tells them, he says, listen, it's not going to rain again and cover the earth with water. The earth will not be destroyed by water again. And, uh, and he says, and here's my sign to you. He says, I'm going to send a rainbow. Now, how many of you, just raise your hands, have seen rainbows? We've seen a lot of rainbows this summer around Spencer County, haven't we? I have, uh, I, I still am infatuated by rainbows. Uh, now, please don't think that makes me unmanly. I don't draw them or have a rainbow tattoo or nothing like that. But, uh, 
But I've always been infatuated by them. When I see one, I, I, I do this. Maybe you're like me. I do this thing where I'm like, all right, there's a rainbow. And I begin to trace it. Because I, from the time I was very young, I've heard this story. Uh, I begin to trace the rainbow because I know that at the end of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold, right? And so uh, I have looked for 45 years. I have desperately been in search of the end of the rainbow. Two weeks ago, Jill and I are driving down Highway 155 going towards Taylorsville. And it was after one of our recent rainstorms. And there was a beautiful rainbow. And for the first time, I saw it coming down. I'm like, Jill, we might get to see the end of the rainbow. And I got excited. And sure enough, we drove where the rainbow came down and ended right there. And guess what? There wasn't a pot of gold there. I never find a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. What was it? What's my problem, Eric? It was on the other end of the rainbow. That's my life story. I'm always on the wrong end of things, you know. But it wasn't there. I didn't see a leprechaun. I didn't see a pot of gold. And I was a little bit disappointed because now uh, maybe I'm to believe that really there's not a pot of gold or i got to figure out how to get to the other end. I'm not sure which one it is. But the truth, listen, the truth of it is we all know that story, right? How many of you, just be honest, have been looking for a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? All right, I'm glad I'm not the only one. There's a few of us. We all know that story, that, that myth, that myth that, we, that, that we've known about since the time I was a little bitty kid. But the truth of it is, the rainbow represents something else. And it's not a pot of gold. The rainbow represents a promise that God has made for us that we can be saved from certain destruction. That he made a way for us. A way of salvation. Amen? And I don't know, maybe it's wrong for us to be looking for gold in something that that, that something far much greater is there. Salvation. Through Jesus. Sometimes we get so filled up with the stories of this world that we forget the greatest story in this world. The story of Jesus. And how we can be rescued and saved from our sins through Christ and through Christ alone. 